Let me remind of um, the three guidelines we have for our reading. The one is humility. That, that's, we must remember that we don't own this text. We don't own this book. And reading this book must be an act of humility. We're, we're servants of this book. And the best we can do like when we're reading any book or listening to any words is to become a a pipeline for it, to let it go through us, to bring it to others. And to do that, we must start by realizing that we are not the beginning, that we are not the end. The energy that that powers our work in life is ultimately prema shakti. Wow. And this is the blessing, of course, of Radharani. The second principle, or the second guideline, is that reading is bhajan. When we read, and when we talk together and share about our reading, we do it together. We do it in a collective way. We pass the the emotions and the experience from one to the other, and we make it a movement. In the same way from the first uh, guideline, the first principle, the idea is not to say it stops here or it begins here, but that we let it flow. The goal is to let it flow, what we're finding in Bhagavad Gita. And the third <coughs> the third guideline or principle is about language, remember. And it's a reminder that while we talk a lot, we human beings, we jivas, that language is not truth. Language is not always honesty. And language is not always sincerity. That language is is also material. It's a covering. So we must not hide behind words we must not hide our hearts behind words. We must both use the words and let them fall away so that our heart can come out. <clears throat> Last time we spent the whole uh, class <clears throat> on verse 3 of chapter 10, which is just a beautiful, beautiful verse. And it brought together <clears throat> two two elements, two Two points. The one is <coughs> so sorry. <coughs> Maybe I'm getting the Vrindavan uh, flu as well. Because the one point is about knowledge that we talk about a lot when we read Bhagavad Gita because we're seeking knowledge, and the other is about what Krishna is. And I didn't. Okay. And the verse is um, something like this. The one from last time. Those who know me, Krishna says, those who know me as unborn and as beginningless, they are free from all evils. They are free. So it's something about knowing and it's something about Krishna. Knowing Krishna, knowing God, which is a very big thing to say, but in in the language of bhakti, loving devotion, God is not a great king on a cloud, sitting on a cloud. God is a friend. And the story of Bhagavad Gita is the story of a conversation between a friend, between two friends. Krishna is talking to Arjuna like a friend. There's love between them. And there's love going in two ways. So when Krishna says in this verse, the one who knows me is free, then we have to ask, what do we mean by knowing Krishna? And really, bhakti, the the practice of loving exchange, the practice of love in action, like Gurudev says, it's all about how we know. It's not about 
what we know. The important thing is how we know. The facts are almost not important. The things that we do know, some of them are important, but mostly are not important. But how we know, the connection we have with God, the relation we have with God, the relation we have with others, and not what the others uh uh, not what the others say and do, but what relation we have in them with them. This is what's uh, important for us. Um, so the secret, in a way, of one of the secrets of Bhagavad Gita is that it's not so important what facts we have in our mind. It's important how we live. It's not important what the facts about the world are, that it's cold in Vrindavan, that my hair is falling out, that my walls are painted red, that I had some yogurt for breakfast. All these facts, they're not so important. But how I live with these facts, this is what happened. This is what's important. How we know the world. How our consciousness sees the world. And most importantly, how our consciousness sees our soul. The relation between our consciousness and our soul. How the world looks to us how we come to the world. These are all parts of spiritual knowledge. So when Krishna says, know me, those who know me, he's not talking about factual knowledge, he's not talking about information, like Gurudev says, how tall Krishna is, what color he is, what clothes he's wearing. Yes, these things are interesting, but the important thing is the spiritual knowledge, the the. The, the knowledge of the soul and the, the knowledge of the soul of God that we have comes directly from the knowledge of the soul, our own soul. So Bhagavati Gita teaches us it doesn't matter really who you are, Japanese or Austrian or old or young or man or woman or tall or short or blue eyes or green eyes. What matters is what your soul is. And the primary characteristic of the soul is love. So, yes, I'm glad to meet you. Hello. Nice to meet you. But what I want to know is, what is the love in your soul? The nice thing about being a bhakta, the nice thing about being a devotee of, of Radharani, <coughs> a devotee of Gurudev, is that we can jump over the nonsense and say, I want to know your soul. I want to see the love in your soul. I'm not really interested in what care, color your hair is, or what size your shoes are. I want to go right to it. And the beautiful freedom that our practice gives us, and that our, that our, um, that our Sangha, that our Sankirtan gives us, is that we can go right to that. We can look at each other and see souls. So Krishna said in this verse, and I've been thinking about it all week, that's why I spend a moment to go back to it. Krishna says, those who know me, and the next question is, how do I know you, Krishna? It's through loving devotion. It's through the loving relation. It's by opening my heart, my soul, and seeing the link in my soul to Krishna. Loving relation means knowing Krishna. This is the confidential knowledge we talked about in chapter nine so much. Mm. So now here's a here's a um, here's a point that's very strong and maybe too strong, but I want to say it. Maybe you'll remember it. Knowing is loving. Wow. Knowing is loving. To know something completely is to love something completely. Wow. Knowing is knowing does not mean having all the facts in your head. Knowing is having the heart open to the other. We love someone means we know someone. Know someone completely, deeply, strongly. That's what love is. Knowing is loving. If you, if you look, if you look at your lover in the eyes and you can say, Honestly, purely, sincerely, I know you. This is exactly the same as saying, I love you. 
I know you means I love you. <clears throat> so, in this verse, Krishna says, those who know me, then will be free. <laughs> you could also say, those who know Krishna are already devotees. They're already bhakta. They're already in love with God. They're already in loving service because there's no other way to have full knowledge but than by love. Anybody who understands verse verse 3 is already in Manjari Bhav. Wow. So read it again and again. If you understand these words, you've already understood the question. Mm. And you've already understood the question is not, about, is not about the facts, but about your soul. And if it's about the soul, then you know this is Gurudev's lesson to us. If you understand the soul, then you understand love. <clears throat> so that was verse ten, three, and now we'll, I think, um, we'll spend most of the, well, all of the rest of the class, I think, on this long verse, which is two verses, uh, chapter ten, four, and five. So most of the editions of Bhagavad Gita put these two together, because. The one continues the other. And it's a very, it's a very unusual verse or two verses, except for a couple of words at the end. It's a list. It's like a grocery list. It's a list of all the qualities of the divine that are in every jiva. There are 20. And we'll discuss them very quickly, briefly, each one. So here's the verse. So the first, except for the last five words, it's just a list. Buddha, Gyanam, Asamaha, Kyasma, Satyam, Dhamma, Sama, Sukam, Dukam, Bhavo, Bhavo, Bhayam, Chabayam, Evacha, Ahimsha, Samati, Tustis, Tapo, Danam, Yaso, Yashaha, Bhavanti, Bhava, Bhutanam, Mata, Eva, Patag, Vita. So here's the translation. Intelligence, knowledge, freedom from doubt and delusion, forgiveness, truthfulness, self-control and calmness, pleasure and pain, birth, death, fear, fearlessness, non-violence, equanimity, Satisfaction, austerity, charity, fame, and infamy are created by me alone. So 20 qualities, all in a row, are created by me alone. And created by me alone, that means they're created in the jiva. They're created by God, they're created by Krishna, and they're put in the soul of, of the jiva. So what we want to do now, really, in this, this class is, as, is understand how they flow from bhakti, how they flow th from loving devotion. First, Prabhupada says in the, in, the, in the commentary, he says, the different qualities of living entities, be they good or bad, are all created by Krishna, and they are described here. So in a way, this is um it's like a map of the soul. We have all these qualities. Some are stronger, some are weaker, some are better, some are worse, some are more um, auspicious, some are less auspicious, but it's like a description of the of the soul, like a doctor would would uh, describe your organs inside your body. Here's Krishna describing your soul, in a way. So all these qualities can tell us something about the way that we relate to divine love, to devotional uh, practice. When Krishna says, these are created in me, he means they originate in me. So they come from Krishna. They're Krishna's qualities too. And since we are part and parcel of Krishna, these qualities are in us as well. But part of the beauty here is that part of what is Krishna's is ours. 
There's already a gift. There's already um, a relationship. There's already um, uh, um, a love, a friendship. The qualities that we have are expansions of the qualities of God. Our soul, with all its different qualities, is an expansion of the soul of, of God. So it's a kind of, the verses, of these two verses, it's kind of way of saying what God has shared with us, these 20 things. And, and it will help us to understand the way that God loves us and the way that we love God, this friendship. It, it comes up in different ways in all 20 of the, of the qualities. And for that reason, too, it's kind of, um, these are the little tools that we use to love. These are the ways that we love. These are the things that God has put in our soul that we can be lovers, too, that we can be divine lovers. Hmm. So in a way, it's 20 modes of devotional love, not just 20 qualities. And of course, it's not material qualities that count. Once again, it's not important how big your feet are <laughs> or how tall you are, what color your eyes are. All these material properties are, are not important. So the qualities we have here are all spiritual properties. And uh, to read it, we find out lots of things. One thing is that we find out that, again, like we've said before, that the divine is everywhere in us, in different ways, in different levels, in different levels of realization, and different levels of of enlightenment. But it's it's there in everyone. According to this verse, no one is lacking the spark of divine love. Everyone owns this. The only difference between us is how much we've embraced it, how much we've let ourselves be this, our spiritual selves, let our swarupa, our, our constitutional uh, spiritual identity come out. Most of us are resisting this in different ways. Most of us are saying, oh, no, no, wait, wait. It's too strong. It's too big. It's too true. We'll wait, maybe on next week. Let me read a book. Let me turn on a film. Let me do something else and not think about what my soul is. That's what most of us are doing. I can tell you I'm an expert. So, so what this is describing for us is the different pathways, the different doors we can open in order to, to release our, our svarup or expose our svarup, our, our spiritual identity. So the love is everywhere in us, in many different ways. It's a matter of letting it, letting it come forth. The first, um, there's my book, looking for my book. The first um, quality is called <clears throat> budir, which uh, Gurudev sometimes talks about in different contexts. Budir means intelligence in the sense of w wisdom. So intelligence, spiritual intelligence, let's say that. And I can just say what uh, Prabhupada says about this. He says, intelligence refers to the power of analyzing things in proper perspective. And what does proper perspective mean for Prabhupada? This means in relation to the soul. There's, there's no intelligence to be found in relating, um, in relating a coffee cup to a bottle of water. Let's see. Here we go. There's nothing to be found here. It's an object. It's another object. There's a, there's no relation between them. But if we put them in perspective, if we put them in a relationship with our souls and understand that in some way, uh, this water is the gift of life and the coffee cup is doing some service for my spiritual life, then we acquire buddhir, intelligence spiritual intelligence. It depends on us. It depends on how we relate to the things that we find in the world. I'll come back to this idea about facts, what a fact is. But the scientific or the philosophical view of a fact is, in fact is that it's just simple and naked and has no relation to anything. It's just true. 
the temperature in Paris is nine degrees. It's a fact. Nothing about anything in spiritual life will change this. But Prabhupada would tell us, wait a minute, nine degrees. This was the temperature of, on the day of the birth of my nephew. This was the temperature that, um, um, of the lovely, um, of the lovely Prashad I ate three weeks ago with my mother. This is the, this is the temperature of the days when I can see the sky clearest and feel the presence of God. This, the same fact, so-called fact, has an entire spiritual existence as well. So, even a, so a scientist would say, well, a fact has no spiritual meaning. I would say that there is no fact that does not have a spiritual meaning, that is not already spiritual, that is not already connected to our soul. If we can relate to it, it's it's a relation with our with our soul. So what, whatever you like, that there's a book on my table, or that uh, I'm coughing in my throat because for one reason or another, all these things are only meaningful when they're linked to my spiritual life, to the life of my my soul. <laughs> so, Prabhupada says proper perspective. He means remember this part of knowledge, and you will have buddhi, you will have wise knowledge. And that's all that matters, says Prabhupada, and says Krishna as well. So that's um, buddhya. The second quality is called, it's very well known to you, it's called jnanam. And we say knowledge. We translate that as knowledge. <coughs> but what does Prabhupada say then? He says, <coughs> knowledge refers to understanding what is spirit and what is matter. So again, we talk about knowledge <coughs> a lot in Bhagavad Gita. And Prabhupada reminds us that the only important knowledge is knowing the difference between the spirit and matter, between the soul and the material world, between the spiritual world and the material world. That's the only thing that matters. That's the only important knowledge we have. We can have knowledge about materials, yes. We can have knowledge about the facts. We can look at science. We can talk about the information about our world. But only by connecting that knowledge, that those facts, with our souls, with our emotions, with our feelings, with our mood, with our bhav, can we have true knowledge. So we can, we can talk about many kinds of experiences of the material world. And it's something we've talked about a lot in this class, that the material world is important. Um, but it becomes important when we feel it. It's lovely to study art, but it's when we let our hearts open to the art that we have true knowledge. It's very nice to study music, to write the notes and to master an instrument, but this is only meaningful to us when we feel the music. It's lovely to read poetry, but only when the poetry goes into our heart does it have meaning. And only then can we talk about knowledge. Again, Gurudev uses the word information about the facts. We don't want information, we want knowledge. We want spiritual knowledge. So when Gurudev says, this is important to understand, sometimes when he's giving class, he says, he doesn't mean memorize it. He doesn't mean write it down in your notebook or even record it on your phone. He means, let it go into your heart. This is to understand, Gurudev says. He means, let that go directly like an arrow into your heart. Let it nourish your love. Let it close the gap between your mind and your, and your, and your heart. He means, let it become part of the increase of love in your everyday practice. In the end, when we're very realized, and most of us just dream of this. Understanding will mean seeing that all experiences are experiences of love. There's another very big thing to say. <laughs> I'm sorry. All experiences, when they're pure, are experiences of love. Your experience of your, of your, um, of your, uh, breakfast oatmeal will be an experience of love. 
it'll make your heart beat. Your experience of driving your car will be an experience of love. This is our aim. So when we sometimes, at least in English, we have this nice expression, rose-colored glasses. My father used to tell me, you see the world through rose-colored glasses, my boy. <clears throat> that means I put on these romantic, loving glasses, and then everything is romantic and loving. <laughs> <laughs> but these are exactly the glasses we want. Except we don't want the glasses on the outside. We want everything to go through our soul and become romantic and loving. Mm. And Prabhupada comments on this, this jnanam idea. He says, <coughs> ordinary knowledge <coughs> obtained by a university education pertains only to matter, and it is not accepted here as knowledge. There, that says it all. Things you learn in university are not spiritual knowledge. And yet I want to contradict Prabhupada. I already did in just a minute ago. Yes, it's true that when we learn science and we go to university and we become philosophers, then we learn about facts. We learn about um, theoretical things. But I believe that hidden in every fact is, is prema. Hidden in every fact there is spiritual knowledge. It's only to us to open up the fact and find it. So, like I said, even the most naked, boring, dead, cold fact, like my shoe size is 43, I promise you I can meditate on my shoe size and get tears in my eyes of love. So I don't think... Now I'm, now I'm going very far, and Gurudev must uh, discipline me if I'm wrong. I don't think that we should stop going to university because they're only facts. I think we should go to university and find the love behind the facts. <laughs> Knowledge, Prabhupada says, well, he, I continue, I read again. Knowledge means knowing the distinction between spirit and matter. And it also means knowing what spirit is and what it looks like and where it's to be found. And as you probably know, it's to be found in the most ordinary places in our everyday lives, in cooking and cleaning and driving the car sometimes. There's also spirit there. So knowledge, I think, means also recognizing spirit in very ordinary places. But Prabhupada insists, and I continue, in modern education, there is no knowledge about the spirit. They are simply taking care of material elements and bodily needs. Therefore, academic knowledge is not complete. He does not say it's false. He says it's not complete. And this is why I permit myself to say it's not complete because it's only lacking the spiritual part. The pure spiritual part which is there waiting for us to discover. And we discover it through our hearts through our love when we when we when we do our our studies or our our philosophical tasks with love then we'll find spirit there yeah. so academic knowledge is not false it's not that the information is wrong it's not that it's not my shoe size 43 it's that we have forgotten to seek the the bhav in my experience of my shoe size in all the walks I went on with my baby daughter in my arms, in the mountains I climbed in Norway, in the cold water that I put my feet in when I was a child, when I cut my toe as a teenager, all these things are in my shoe size. All these deeply emotional feelings are in my experience of my shoe. So it's not that 43 is wrong, it's that it's incomplete. <laughs> We mustn't, we mustn't uh, hate the material world. We must f find the love in it. Mm. And maybe, maybe this is the place to remember lo love and se separation. The idea of love and separation, viraha, viraha. Pardon me. That we live in the material world, we feel the love there, but the love is incomplete because we're separated from this. From um from a perfect realization. 
but we're grateful that we feel it in the material world. We're grateful that we see the traces of of love in our in our cooking and cleaning, because this reminds us of the full presence of another one, the full presence of of love that we can aspire to and then and grow to and develop toward. So the little tiny bits of love and, and the little tiny bits of beauty in our everyday life are so inspiring because they promise us the deeper, the deeper love. This is, this is another way of understanding love in separation. When, when Radha is separated from one, she sees little bits of him everywhere. And this makes her both terribly sad and terribly happy. This is her love and separation. She's the model for love and separation, isn't she? That everywhere she looks when she sees, when she's not with him, she looks at a candle burning and she sees, she, she sees Mohan. She looks at a, she, she looks at a shoe on the ground and she sees Mohan. Our beloved is everywhere. And this says, this pulls us, this pulls her out of her house to go and meet him. And this pulls of our, us out of our houses to go and meet uh, our lover uh, as well in our in our everyday lives. It's a great, great inspiration. And I'm, I'm very, very grateful for it. This incomplete love that I feel in life, it's a promise that it will be complete. Or at least it's a promise that I can increase it if I if I apply myself, if I focus, if I purify my heart. This is very, very encouraging. It's really, it's Radharani's playful energy there. It's saying, here I'll give you a taste of this beautiful divine love. A little tiny bit of prema, prema shakti will lift us from our, our everyday lives. So this longing, the longing for what we don't have, it opens our hearts. It gives us access to our feelings. It increases our desire. When I see a beautiful thing, I get greedy. When I see a sunset, sorry to be so romantic, but when I see a sunset, I get greedy for not for less sunset or to keep looking at that sunset, but for more sunset, deeper sunset, stronger colors, brighter light, right? And what's even better, when we have these small experiences in everyday life, they're training for the bigger love. They teach us how to love. They strengthen our heart. They make our heart more sensitive to see the beauty and the love. So it's like going to the gym to do our workouts a bit. It's the workout of the heart. When we see a sunset, when we see a beautiful child, when we see, when we taste lovely prashad, and it's also practicing to increase our love and our, increase our ability to love. <sighs> okay, then the, the third quality is called Asamoha, which means freedom from doubt and delusion. No doubt, you know, delusion means to, to fool ourselves, to be foolishly wrong. And Prabhupada says freedom from the doubt and delusion can be achieved when one is not hesitant and when he understands the transcendental philosophy. <coughs> And I think in a way what he's talking about, Prabhupada, is surrender, of surrendering ourselves to our feelings, to, to trying to give up our, our doubts, our, our second thoughts, our thinking about it. We have to stop being hesitant. We're all hesitant. Like I was saying before, we're always, material life is all about finding reasons not to surrender. Got to go to work, got to, got to clean the house, got to cook the food. Don't have time for surrender today, maybe tomorrow. This is the kind of doubts that, that Prabhupada says we can become free from. And then he continues. He says, slowly but surely he becomes, that is the devotee becomes free from bewilderment and bewilderment. He means. De delusion, foolish, foolishly being wrong. And what is the main way of being foolish? We rem we might remember the main way that the most important way that we are foolish, we jivas, it's for looking, it's by looking for love in 
in the intelligence, in facts, in science, and then, of course, being shocked by not finding it. So bewilderment, it's a big word, it means being foolish in this way, is kind of like thinking there might be love there, but not being able to accept it, or even seeing love and not accepting it. So, in a way, everything about the divine, everything we learn about Radha Mohan makes no sense unless we open our hearts, unless we surrender. And unless we surrender to the idea that it's not about the intelligence, it's about, it's about the soul. Finally, Prabhupada says, nothing should be accepted blindly. Everything should be accepted with care and with caution. And this is quite beautiful. Nothing should be accepted blindly. This is something that rational people say, isn't it? You shouldn't accept something without logic, or you shouldn't accept something without reason. You shouldn't accept something without um, proof. But Prabhupada needs something different. He means we shouldn't accept something without soul. If you don't see it from your soul, then you're blind, and you can't see, and your eyes are closed. So you need to accept it, to use his words, he says, with care and with caution. We all know what this means to look to what to see through our eyes, no, sorry, through our souls. It's a very special feeling, and everybody here knows what that is. Now we need to do more of it, to see the world with our hearts, and not with our brains. The fourth quality is ksama, and Prabhupada um, translates this forgiveness. <clears throat> but I also saw a translation which was tolerance. There's a the way around. So tolerance of others, forgiveness of others. And he says, forgiveness should be practiced and one should excuse the minor offenses of others. <coughs> now here we, we understand the word forgiveness. It's hard for people in Christian traditions not to understand this word in a special way. For Japanese, I'm sorry, I don't know quite what the word corresponds to. But to forgive in Christian tradition says, or in Islamic or Judaic tradition, says there's a rule that you have broken that hurt me, and if it wants to be good again, then I have to say, I forgive you, it's okay. So there's a moral judgment, and I cancel the moral judgment. You hurt me, but I cancel this crime, I forgive you. Mm. This is the Western way of thinking forgiveness. Someday I want to talk to Jainam Jainam Maharaj about Japanese way of forgiveness and what that means. I'm sure it's quite different. Mm. But the the point is that Bhagavad Gita sees forgiveness and tolerance differently. Forgiveness means, in Western tradition, means there's an authority outside of the heart. Maybe there's a law book. And I look in the book and it says, it's wrong to steal the chocolate from the children. And then I see someone stealing the chocolate from the children, and I get the book, I say, ah, it's wrong. Here it's wrong. And then I say, but I forgive you. But forgiveness in Bhagavad Gita means um, embracing the divine in ourselves, in understanding that I and the person who took the chocolate are the same, are linked. It's understanding that the crime, the crime, so to speak, of this other person who took the chocolate is my crime, that our souls are connected, and we are one one soul. We are part and parcel of God. And when we judge someone, say, you're bad, you took chocolate, then we cut this link between us. We say, I'm someone who does not steal chocolate. You are someone who steals chocolate. We are different. Forgiveness, tolerance in bhakti means understanding that the other is the same as me. Understanding that the other is my brother or my sister. Understanding that I could have done the chocolate stealing too. That there is no important difference between us. There are only external, unimportant differences between us. And the fact that you took the chocolate and I did not 
is not an important difference between us. I have to see myself in you. I have to see the chocolate thief in the other one. I have to see it myself in his or her acts. I have to understand that this other person is, is looking for the same things that I am, wanting the same, desiring the same, and basically wanting love. To, for, to forgive that person means to forgive myself and to forgive everyone, essentially. So really, tolerance and forgiveness is not applying a law. It's applying, it's realizing that we're all the same, spiritually speaking. We're all jivas. We're all made of the same spiritual material. Some of us do foolish things. Some of us don't do foolish things. But we're all within the same. There's no moral difference between us. There's not good and bad people. Some people do foolish things and some others don't. Others do foolish things other times. We're all linked. This is what Atma is, means. Atma means being part of Paramatma. The fifth quality is called Satyam. Prabhupada translates truthfulness, not lying, telling the truth. But here again, maybe you start to feel how Prabhupada thinks and you know what, how he's going to define truthfulness, not lying. He's going to start by saying, not lying according to whom? Who decides who's lying? He says, I quote now Prabhupada, Satyam means the, that facts should be presented as they are for the benefit of others, for the benefit. <clears throat> oh, pardon, I'm reading wrong. They should be presented as they are for the benefit of others. So this means that the truth about the world is in relation to others. There's only truth in relation, in loving, devotional relation for him. So again, the, the temperature in Paris, nine degrees, is dead. Cold fact, unless it relates to the life of someone I care about, someone I love, someone I'm in a relation with. Think if I, I were the last man in the world living, and I look in my thermometer and it says nine degrees Paris. This would be absolutely meaningless. Would have no meaning. No meaning. I, because I would have no one to tell, put on your socks, sweetheart. I would know, I would know, have no one to give this to. I would not be able to think about making a cup of tea to, against the cold. I wouldn't be able to think about dressing my child or, or caring about someone who's walking out on the streets. It has no meaning, no truth, unless there's someone to give it to. Facts, again, I said it before, but I say it here too. Facts are never completely dead. They always carry a small trace of love, or you don't even see them. You don't even understand them. So for a devotee like you, there are no naked facts. All facts are the potential to make a gift. Right? I found out, I found out that there's a tree growing outside. It has meaning because I can tell it to you. I can give it as a gift, share it with you. <clears throat> to say that it's raining calls forth love. To say that your hair is black color makes my heart beat faster. To say that your taxi is coming at three o'clock makes my heart cry louder. There's no fact that's naked and without love for a devotee. 4.30 in the morning, that's a fact. But I know that somewhere there's arti happening and I can hear the music. 8 p.m., it's just a fact, right? I know it's 8 p.m. That means Buddha Dev's having his dinner. And I feel love. There's no fact without the love. Tell me the most boring fact and I'll tell you the love in it. It's a challenge. Or challenge yourself. Find the most boring fact in some book. Just open a book and find the love in that fact. There's a good exercise for a devotee. A good bhakti game. The population of Nepal. Find some love in that. So, uh, Prabhupada continues now, I cite, facts should not be misrepresented. According to social conventions, it is said that one can speak the truth only when it is 
palatable to others, even only if it tastes good, people like it. But that is not truthfulness. <clears throat> so in other words, only when the heart of the other is open, and when our hope is open, that's a heart is open, can facts be true. So it doesn't, it's not, the scientific method would say, well, my thermometer says nine degrees in Paris. So I bring another scientist with her thermometer and says nine degrees, then it's true. No. In bhakti, when the, the fact is received with love, when it's appreciated, when it has a meaning for the other, then it's true. <laughs> Prabhupada goes on now, says the truth should be spoken in a straight and forward way so that others will understand understand actually what the facts are. If a man is a thief, and if people are warned that he is a thief, that is true. Although sometimes the truth is unpalatable, not, not nice. One should not refrain from speaking it. Although sometimes the truth is unpalatable, one should not refrain from speaking it. Truthfulness demands that the facts be presented as they are for the benefit of others. That is the definition of truth. That's what was in the verse. For the, for the benefit of others, facts must serve someone. Facts must be seva for them to be true. Otherwise there, otherwise, there is no truth. So in order to find spiritual truth, we must, we must speak in a way that communicates with the heart of others. Say true things about the world is possible if we speak to the heart of the other. Just like the Atma is part and parcel of Paramatma, the, the super soul, so the little bits of truth that we speak are part and parcel of the spiritual truth. Any tiny fragment that touches a heart is also touching the divine. Every truth we tell with the heart is speaking in part with the with the voice of, of God, with the voice of the divine. The sixth quality, Dhamma, means self-control. Self-control, says Prabhupada, means that the senses should not be used for unnecessary personal enjoyment. There is no prohibition against meeting the proper needs of the senses, but unnecessary sense enjoyment is detrimental for spiritual advancement. Therefore, the senses should be restrained from unnecessary use. And I think we can define unnecessary use as use that doesn't increase our love, that doesn't increase our spiritual pleasure, which is what love is. So it doesn't mean Prabhupada is saying we don't need to lock the lock the the door to the cupboard to keep us from eating the chocolate he means that if we're going to eat the chocolate then eat the divine in the chocolate give it as an offering to Radha Mohan and then eat many of us know how divine chocolate is the point is to remember the divine in the chocolate then there's no need there's it's even wrong not to eat it because this pleasure that comes from the chocolate, when it's felt as love, when it's lovingly felt, we know where it comes from. It comes from the mouth of Radharani. This pleasure from your chocolate, it comes right from Radharani. The seventh quality is shama, control of the mind. Prabhupada says, similarly, the mind should not indulge in unnecessary thoughts. That is called shama or calmness. Nor should one spend one's time pondering, thinking about, over e earning money. That is a misuse of thinking power. The mind should be used to understand the prime necessity of human beings. And that should be presented authoritatively. What is the prime necessity of human beings? To discover the soul and to increase the loving flow from and through the soul. 
the primary necessity of devotion of human beings is to practice devotion. And that can only be done in calmness. It can't be done with anger or anxiety. I'm sorry, my computer, my internet stopped for a minute. I think it's okay now. Yes. Good, thank you. The eighth quality is called sukham or happiness. You've heard this word before, happiness. And Prabhupada says, the power of thought should be developed in association with persons who are authorities in the scriptures, saintly persons, and spiritual masters, and those whose thinking is highly developed. Sukham, pleasure or happiness, should always be in that which is favorable for the cultural, for the, I'm sorry, the cultivation of the spiritual knowledge of Krishna consciousness. So it's very much what we said in the last quality. There's no pleasure that is wrong if it is increasing love. There's no material pleasure that is wrong if it increases spiritual knowledge, spiritual insight. This is the path to happiness, to increase spiritual knowledge. This is what we do every day. It's what we try to do a little bit every day. It's increase our knowledge, increase our love, make sure that we're loving more and not less from day to day, that we express our love in more places, in more ways, and more deeply. The ninth one is Dukham. So we had Sukham, happiness. Now Dukham is unhappiness or, or un, uh, what do you say, favorableness. And now Prabhupada says, and similarly, that which is painful or which causes distress is that which is unfavorable for the cultivation of Krishna consciousness. Anything favorable for the development of Krishna consciousness should be accepted. Anything unfavorable should be rejected. So this is quite clear, I think. Favorable, unfavorable. Favorable is what brings us closer to the heart, what increases our love, what increases, increases our understanding of our soul, our spiritual knowledge. Unfavorable is what leads us away from the heart, what makes us more bitter, what makes us less loving. This is easy for everyone to tell. We can all check and judge. We know this about every bit of our life, every single thing we know. We are, we are the best judges. When I'm when I'm uh, cleaning my shoes, does that make me angry or does that make me feel love? And I can change this just by my attitude towards the task. Am I serving an Adarani in my everyday activities? When in when I'm when I'm doing my work, when I'm cooking my food, when I'm tidying my house, am I serving the cause of love? Am I increasing love in the world? This is the one. The one talent we all have, all jivas, but most of all devotees like you have this talent. We can put more love in the world. We can't always put uh, more money in the world. We can't always put more food in the world. We can't always put more poetry in the world. But everybody, everybody can put more love in the world. That is the one talent we all possess. Through the most uh, small gestures, we can do that. And that is what our task is, to increase love. By increasing love, we become closer to Manjari Bhav, we become closer to um, serving the goddess of love, Radharani. Hmm. And we do this by, by putting love in our tasks, but also by treating each other with love, treating fellow jivas with love. And how do we do that? By seeing them, by seeing the divine in them, by seeing their souls, seeing, by seeing them as souls. So whenever we look at our, whenever we look at our brother or, or sister or husband to see the, the divine, just you, whenever you say hello, when you think, when you say hello, think, I see your divine soul. Well, actually, just speak Hindi. Namaste. 
Namaste, we say all the time that to, to mean hello. Namaste also means, or namas, namaskara means I see. So in Hindi, we don't think about it, but when we say namaste, we're saying, I see God in you, or I see the divine in you. This is what hello means in Hindi. It's really beautiful. So put that in your language. Guten Tag, Guskot. I see the God, the godly in you. Hmm. Uh, the tenth quality is birth. The eleventh is death. So these go together. Bhava and Abhava. And Prabhupada says, these should be understood to refer to the body, not to the soul, of course. The soul does not die or is not born. As far as the soul is concerned, he says, there is neither birth nor death. That we have discussed in the beginning of Bhagavad Gita, in chapter 2. Birth and death apply to one's embodiment in the material world. And then it becomes very interesting with the next two qualities, fear, bhayam, and fearlessness, abhayam, because these are very linked to birth and death. Uh, Prabhupada says, a person in Krishna consciousness has no fear, by his activities, he is sure to go back to the spiritual sky. So he, he has no fear because he's not going to die. Back home, back to Godhead. Therefore, his future is very bright, says Prabhupada. A person in Krishna consciousness, this was Prabhupada's way of speaking, it's a person who is soul conscious. Krishna consciousness means soul conscious. And we would take it with Gurudev one step further and say, soul conscious, but conscious that the energy of the soul is love. So conscious of the soul and conscious that the soul is love. Two things. Fear then, think about when you've been afraid. Fear is when, when we let e ego have control. And why is it fear? It's because we, we feel that something untrue is guiding us. Something plastic, something superficial. Fear is the feeling that we've forgotten ourselves. <laughs> the very first time I met Gurudev in um, 2000, and f I don't remember, a long time ago, I asked him a question. I asked him, why are people insecure? <laughs> and he answered me immediately. He didn't even think. He immediately answered it's because they've forgotten their souls and they're letting their lives be guided by ego. This is what fear is. This is the definition of fear, that we let our lives be guided by ego and we know that our ego has no control of anything. <laughs> fear is the thought that I've wasted my time on the wrong things. <laughs> It's the fear that I've lost myself, that I've wasted my time, that I've wasted the love in my heart. This is truly what fear is. Prabhupada says then, others, however, do not know what the future holds. People with Krishna's consciousness, he says, do know what the future holds. They're going to go back to Godhead. So others do not know what the future holds. They have no knowledge of what the next life holds. So they are therefore in constant anxiety. If we want to get free from anxiety, then the best course, the best path, is to understand Krishna and be situated always in Krishna consciousness. In that way, we will be free from all fear. And now here we go back to this, this verse, um, the last verse from last time, about understanding Krishna. What, what does it mean to understand Krishna, you remember? It means to understand that Krishna is the Krishna is a loving soul. To understand Krishna means to have a loving relation with Krishna. So those, the best course for us is to have a loving relation with Krishna. Mm. Then Abhayam, fearlessness, <coughs> having no fear. Prabhupada writes, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is stated that fear is caused by our absorption in the illusory energy, <clears throat> maya, ego, etc. 
But those who are free from the illusory energy, those who are confident that they are not the material body, <clears throat> that they are spiritual parts of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and are therefore engaged in transcendental service of Supreme Godhead, they have nothing to fear. The, their future is bright. Fear, he says, he goes on, is a condition of persons who are not in Krishna consciousness. Bhayam, fearlessness, is only possible for one in Krishna consciousness. So this is exactly what Gurudev told me 14 years ago. Fear is the condition of people who are stuck in their ego, or not who are not, who don't know that they have a soul, do not know their soul. The fourteenth quality is ahimsa, non-violence. And Prabhupada writes, non-violence means that one should not do anything which will put others into misery or confusion. <clears throat> not do anything which will put others into misery or confusion. It's impossible it's impossible to love and cause sadness. If your love, if your acts cause sadness, then it's not love, it's something else. It's interested love or uncareful love, but it's not love. The best form of nonviolence is to let love permeate everything and to seek to increase the love, to find higher love, deeper love. That is the, the key to, to nonviolence, to ahimsa. And Prabhupada's writing, material activities that are promised by so many politicians, sociologists, <laughs> philanthropists, let's just add philosophers, do not produce very good results because the politicians and philanthropists have no transcendental vision. They do not know what is actually beneficial for human society. So let's stop here a minute. In order to do good, we have to have transcendental knowledge. We have to we have to know that we're in a relation with God. That is the creation, the condition for doing good. They have to know that this is beneficial for human beings, for human society. And Prabhupada goes on, ahimsa, so nonviolence, means that people do not uh, sorry, it means people should be trained in such a way that the full realization, I'm sorry, the full utilization of the human body can be achieved. And by this he means using the human body for devotional service. And that's what he says when he goes on saying, the human body is meant for spiritual realization. So any movement or any commissions, tasks, which do not further that end, commit violence on the human body. That which furthers future spiritual happiness of the people in general is called nonviolence. So there's a very special and unique definition of nonviolence, but something that advances spiritual happiness, something that advances love. Everything we do that advances love is to be considered nonviolence. <laughs> 15, samatha, equanimity, or indifference, not caring, not, not having any cares. Prabhupada writes, this refers to the freedom from attachment and aversion. So it's not a negative idea. It's not like being, uh, it's not like I don't care because uh, I don't uh, value you. It's that I don't care because I can't do anything to change things. Prabhupada again says to be very much attached or to be very much detached is not the best. The material world should be accepted without attachment or aversion. Similarly, that which is favorable for prosecuting Krishna's consciousness, Krishna consciousness should be accepted. That which is unfavorable should be rejected. The sixteenth is to sleep satisfaction. Prabhupada says, a person in Krishna consciousness has nothing to reject and nothing to accept unless it is, uh, unless, uh, it is useful in the prosecution. I've read, I just read this one, didn't I? I'm sorry. 
I'm a bit tired now. I think we'll finish soon. The 17th is tapas, austerity, or penance. Prabhupada writes, there are many rules and definitions in the Vedas which apply here, like rising early in the morning and taking a bath. Sometimes it is very troublesome to rise early in the morning, but whatever voluntary trouble one may suffer in this way is called penance. So if we voluntarily do something difficult in order to carry out our spiritual tasks, it's called penance. Similarly, there are prescriptions for fasting on certain days of the month. One may not be inclined to practice such fasting, but because of his determination to make advancement in the science of Krishna consciousness, he should accept such bodily troubles which are recommended. However, one should not fast unnecessarily or against Vedic injunctions. So in other words, fasting must be, fasting is good if it's in line with devotional service, if it's advancing devotion, if it's increasing love, if it's done with desire, if it's done with happiness. Prabhupada says one should not fast for some political pur- purpose. That is described in Bhagavad Gita as fasting in ignorance. And anything done in ignorance or passion does not lead to spiritual advancement. So only these penances that are done in devotion, that are done for spiritual advancement, for increasing love, uh, have a function. Everything done in the mode of goodness does does advance one, however, and fasting done in terms of the Vedic injunctions enriches one in spiritual knowledge. So if we follow the Vedic rules in a spirit of devotion, in a spirit of bhakti, then they will bring us advantages. But politics is external to the heart, external to the to the soul. Uh, Dhanam, charity. Prabhupada says, charity, as as far as charity is concerned, one should give 50% of his earnings to some good cause. And what is a good cause? Well, I bet we can guess, can't we? Something that advances love, that advances our deepening of spiritual consciousness. But Prabhupada says, it is that which is conducted in terms of Krishna consciousness. That is not only a good cause, but it is the best cause. Because Krishna is good, his cause is also good. Thus charity could not, sorry, thus charity should be given to a person who is engaged in Krishna consciousness. It goes on, according to Vedic literature, it is enjoined, it's demanded, that charity should be given to the brahmanas. This practice is still followed, although not very nicely in terms of Vedic injunction. But the injunction, the command, the rule, is that charity should be given to the sannyasis. Why? Because they are engaged in higher cultivation of spiritual knowledge. A brahmana is supposed to devote his whole life to understanding Brahman. A brahmajana is one who knows Brahman. He is also called a brahmana. Thus, charity is offered to the brahmanas because, since they are always engaged in higher spiritual service, they have no time to earn their livelihood. In the Vedic, in the Vedic literature, charity is also to be awarded to the renouncer of life, the sannyasi. The sannyasis beg from door to door, not for money, but for missionary purposes. The system is that they go from door to door to awaken the householders from the slumber of ignorance. So they're both begging and teaching. Prabhupada goes on, because the householders are engaged in family affairs and have forgotten their actual purpose in life, awakening their Krishna consciousness, it is the business of sannyasis to go as beggars to the householders and encourage them to be Krishna conscious. As it is said, in the Vedas, one should awake, one, one should awake and achieve what is due him 
what is owed to him in this human form of life. This knowledge and method is distributed by the sannyasis. Hence, charity is to be given to the renouncer of life, to the brahmanas, and similar good causes, not to any whimsical cause. So essentially, to summarize, charity which is given to advance spiritual enlightenment, to advance love, to advance deepening of knowledge of the soul, is good. Other kind of charity is foolish. So the two last qualities are yasha and ayasha, fame and infamy. So fame being known for good things, infamy being known for bad things. Fame, says Prabhupada, should be according to Lord Chaitanya, who said that a man is famous when he is known as a great devotee. That is real fame. If one has become a great man in Krishna consciousness and is, it is known, then he is truly famous. One who does not have such a fame is infamous. So a very beautiful definition of of devotion, of, sorry, of, of fame. It's one who is a good devotee. And then infamy, the last one. All these qualities are manifest throughout the universe, in human society and in the society of the demigods. There are many forms of humanity on other planets, and these qualities are there. And now Prabhupada finishes the commentary of the verse by saying, Now, for one who wants to advance in Krishna consciousness, Krishna creates all these qualities, but the person develops them himself from within. So a really, really important way to conclude this verse, or these two verses, all these qualities are within us, but it's up to us to use them properly in order to advance in, in consciousness, to advance in bhakti. They're at our, they're our, they're our, they are at our disposal, they are available to us, but we have to use them correctly. Prabhupada says, one who engages in the devotional service of the Supreme Lord develops all the good qualities, as arranged by the Supreme Lord. Of whatever we find, good or bad, the origin is Krishna. Krishna is the origin of everything. Nothing can manifest in this material world which is not Krishna. Everything in the material world is an expansion of Krishna. That is knowledge, although we know not, although we know that things are differently situa situated, we should realize that everything flows from Krishna. So all these things in the jiva, all these characteristics, all these qualities, give us the great potential to grow in spiritual life, to deepen our love, to increase our love, but we have to take responsibility, according to Prabhupada, to realize them. So that completes the commentary to, to the verses 10, 4, and 5, and that's where we'll stop for today. Rati, Rati, Gopal.